Welcome to Future Explorations. I'm glad you can join us. My name is Victor Martinez, and this podcast is dedicated to the exploration of the diversity in perspectives around the concepts of change as a constant we humans need to embrace, long-term thinking as an approach for everything we should build and create, and the limits that our human nature, physiology, society, environment, and technology impose on us by their own intrinsic characteristics. It is your task and mine to identify the connections between all views, to discover the interdependence and complementarity of knowledge and ideas. In that way, we might get a clearer picture of what that sustainable future could look like and how we can design the transition to get us there. Today, I have the immense pleasure to talk to Dr. Farhad Dastur. Dr. Farhad Dastur obtained psychology degrees from UBC and a PhD from Dalhousie University. He has served as faculty member at Kwantlen Polytechnic University for 21 years and was recently recognized with Senate's Distinguished Service Award. Dr. Dastur shares his enthusiasm for the mind by teaching introductory psychology, evolutionary psychology, perception, and cognitive ergonomics. His various leadership roles at Quantlin have provided him with insights into how higher education functions and how it can be improved. Currently, he serves as an educational consultant for the Teaching and Learning Commons, where he promotes the scholarship of teaching and learning. In 2019, he founded Quantlin's Virtual Reality Lab, which has become a creative hub for students, alumni, and other collaborators to engage in research, educational projects, and artistic creations. Dr. Dastur, thank you so much for being here today with us. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. And please, it's, it's for hard. We're, we're good friends. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. I was going to start with that, that um, um, if I, I'm allowed Farhad. Um, is, a, is a colleague in uh, Quantum Polytechnic, is a, is a dear friend. We have had many, many interesting discussions, and that's why I wanted to invite him, because, uh, you know, beyond his area of expertise, he's a wonderful, you're a wonderful person, person with uh, <laughs> Thank you. really interesting perspectives on life and a bunch of, of things. It's, it's always a pleasure to have conversation with you. So again, thank you. Thank you for, for, uh, for this time. Um, we are recording almost at the end of the year. We had a really heavy snow in Metro Vancouver today. So if by any chance we hear kids running and, and screaming is because they're playing outside with the snow. Uh, so just, just a, a heads up for that. And um, I, will add, I would like to start by asking some very basic, basic things about your areas of expertise, because there are, there are many and, and you know, first starting to understand what they are. And, and then we can maybe discuss how they connect and, and, and um, what you know, is, is, is the future that you see in this. Um, so in order to start, could, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself in a more in a less official way, where, where you are right now, how you got there, and what, what are you really interesting research is about? Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Victor. This is a, a really great opportunity to have the kinds of conversations that I love that don't happen enough. So um, congratulations on, on this podcast and all the great conversations it's going to stimulate. Um, you know, who I am, where I am, it's a big question, of course. Um, I've been teaching at Kwantlen Polytechnic University for 21 years. Um, I've taught at other universities as well. But KPU is a, is a teaching focused university and that's sort of my passion is to really connect with students and to uh, share with them the ideas that stimulate me that I think are valuable um, and to really see where they will go with their lives using education as the vehicle for, for creating really great futures for themselves. Um, so I'm very happy to be uh, an educator um, I do do some research. Uh, KPU is not a, a research university, so it, it tends not to be the primary uh, focus of my work. But, but to me, research is very important. I was educated at research universities, uh, University of British Columbia and Dalhousie University. And so I understand how to do research and the value of research. But um, to connect research to teaching and then to connect, of course, research to the, the you know, complex problems of our times um, 
that's sort of the the place that I am really interested in in inhabiting that space. So yes, I've I've been teaching many courses in psychology. Um, and about 2019, I created the virtual reality lab at the KPU Richmond campus. And it's really a space, it's a nexus for bringing together uh, collaborations, interdisciplinary collaborations from faculty like you and your students in design, product design specifically. Uh, but you know, we, we, we are really open to all different approaches and different ways of thinking because that's where you get creativity. That's where you can really solve complex problems. So the lab has about um, 30 square meters of space. We have equipment and we now have about 10 students who I can barely uh, keep track of all of their initiatives. In fact, uh, they are starting their own podcast, kind of following in your footsteps uh, to talk about, um, you know, extended realities and the themes of, of education and societal problems broadly. They're still trying to figure it all out. And I mentioned that because it was their idea. And I find myself uh, very often with this group of students just amazed at the initiatives and the motivation and the talent um, that they bring. And I contrast that sometimes to the classroom experience where it's a bit more challenging to activate that. And I think there's reasons for that. Maybe we can go into that later in, in, the, uh, in the podcast. Um, but the lab is a place where, you know, for some reason, some magic sauce and recipe has brought this kind of ability for ideas to be stimulated and to find expression. So that's something I'm looking at very closely and I'm very interested how it plays out. Um, in addition to that work, I, I also, and sort of at the other end of the spectrum, right? So we're talking about virtual reality, the latest technologies to immerse ourselves in other realities. Uh, but at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I am interested and always have been interested in nature-based education, which in many ways is exactly the opposite because it, it, it sort of removed the layers of technology and get students and, and myself, educators, back into the first classroom of the world, which was nature. And that's the classroom um, that humanity grew up in as a species. Um, and so in that sense, it comes, connects to another interest I've had ever since graduate days, uh, which is this idea of evolution. And the idea that we are first and foremost, a, a biological manifestation of life, uh, of, of nature, um, and we inherit uh, a, a, a whole set of, of designs, if I could use that word in the original biological sense, um, that help us to navigate and survive and connect and communicate and reproduce. Um, and so in that sense, we are no different than any other species on the planet. But we've forgotten that. Or maybe we, you know, we, we, we sometimes even oppressed it. Um, but it's always been there. And um, of course, we, we discover it when, when it snows, like today, and you go out and you realize how cold it is. And immediately you're reminded that you have a biology <laughs> as soon as you come out of the cocoon of your home. Um, with all the changes of climate change, of course, climate chaos, um, they, we had the most intense heat on record in British Columbia in the summer. Then we had the wettest fall on record. And now we're having one of the coldest winters on record. Is that, um, are those dots unconnected? You know, maybe there's a difference, obviously, between climate and weather. But, uh, you know, part of the, what the human mind is capable of doing is, is seeing a bigger picture, projecting into the future. I don't know if it's our, if that comes easily to us, but we can um, try to encourage that type of thinking. And I think that's what your podcast is to, to some degree about. Yeah, yeah, that for sure is, is, is one of the things that we are exploring uh, together with, with many others. And, and the, the interesting critical thing is how everything somehow connects sometimes and, and, and these connections and interdependencies that we, I, I truly believe we are just not taking into consideration for, for you know, again, designing the future that we want. Um, and there are so many complexities in, in what I just said, but um, starting, starting from, from the beginning, talking about evolution, and there are several topics that I have here prepared. I, I, I did a little bit of research preparing for this interview um, that I would like to talk, but let's start, let's start with the basics. Um, sure. You mentioned evolutionary biology. Yeah. Um, we, we have heard about Darwin and evolution. 
uh, in school, probably primary or secondary school, elementary school. Um, but if you can give us a little bit of refreshing, what, what is evolutionary biology? Where does, does it come from? What is it looking for? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, evolution in its simplest sense, and I ask my, my students this question, you know, what do you think of, what do you think evolution is? And they come up with some really interesting answers, and some of them kind of are zone in on the, on, on the, on the, the, the modern idea. But at, at, at its fundamental, it's about change. That's all it is. And, uh, and then we can ask, well, you know, how does change happen? Why does change happen? What is the tempo of change? Um, what are the forces that, that distort it or, or uh, thwart it or, or accelerate it? So I think beginning with the, the scientists um, in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s in Europe primarily, um, noticing that um, there is change that is happening in the biological world. You know, and people were starting to dig up fossils of, of creatures that no longer exist. And we certainly see change in geology. We see it in other areas, in, in non-life areas. So the I, you know, you mentioned Darwin, and, and I think a lot of people incorrectly think that Darwin came up with the idea of evolution. He, he didn't. In fact, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was talking about evolution uh, many, way before him. And, and many, many scientists were. But what they didn't quite understand was the mechanism of evolution, how it happens. And that's really the contribution of, of Darwin and another great scientist who, who co-discovered the theory of natural selection, but unfortunately yes. gets a footnote in, in the history books. Uh, that's, uh, that's George Wallace. Um, yeah. And so to, you know, they, there's a lot of history that I don't think we have time necessarily to go into it, but we should, give, we should call it the, the, the Darwin-Wallace theory. And, and natural selection is, is really about variation. It's about variability. It's about the fact that there's, there's a lot of differences in a species. From butterflies to blue whales to humans, uh, people are different sizes. They have different abilities. They run at different speeds. They have different immune systems. There's so much variability and that's just a fact of nature. We forget that sometimes, but it's, it's, it's very true when you look deeply. If you have children, you can see your children are different from each other, even though they came from the same parents and they're being raised largely in the same household. Um, so variation is, is real. Um, and then the next idea that um, is important to understand is that that variability can be inherited. It can pass down from generation to generation. Not all variation is inherited. So my, my son um, colored his hair red a few months ago. Okay. And, um, you know, that change didn't come from me. <laughs> I've never had red hair. It's not a genetic variation, right? It's a cultural one. So, so putting aside that there's obviously cultural variation in people, you know, tattoos and body piercings and hair color, uh, if they, if they dye it. Uh, but the variation we're interested in is the, is the biological variation, and that can be inherited. The next idea is that there's a competition for resources in, in life. There's a competition for food for avoiding being eaten, uh, the, all these survival pressures, right? To find mates, to convince a mate to reproduce, to, to raise that offspring, if that's the kind of creature you are. Some, of course, don't. They just mate and then leave, and the offspring are on their own. So there's all kinds of solutions and patterns in nature. And there's this just tremendous diversity out there. And we're trying to find some unifying principles that connect it all. So, so natural selection is that theory that tries to find that unity by saying that when you start with variation and then if it's inherited and then there's a selection for certain traits that are are there better solutions than the other traits that exist and those traits will um, now be selected for which means they will survive which means there will be a better chance of those traits being passed down to the next generation right mm -hmm. now that takes time of course the the rate of time differs depending on how fast the species reproduces and how strong the pressure is so you know one of the things that disturbs me right now it, with the coronavirus uh, conversation is very few people use the word evolution to, to talk about it but it's actually a classic example of evolution in many ways right mm -hmm. so what is a variant we have the omicron variant we have the delta variant this these are are versions of the coronavirus that were selected for by evolution right mm -hmm. because they yeah. have a different um, virulence, they have a different rate of reproduction, and that can be beneficial to them. So the best way to really understand, um, you know, what corona is doing and where it's going is to invoke ideas of evolutionary change so that we can predict what's going to happen. 
So yes. it requires time, right? But in, on, on, for a virus, the time scales are dramatically shorter, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they, they can be an order of, of hours, days, and weeks. If, if I may, just, just I, I'd like to know that you touched that point. Something that I, I, I have heard before and, and, and for me makes complete sense is that in, in the, uh, let's say, in the natural world, uh, as you mentioned, viruses evolve. Um, and the way that they normally evolve, these mutations happen when the virus, which is, is not an, a, a live entity, they need a host in order to be alive and reproduce and so on. Those mutations, which is the base of evolution, as far as I understand, happens when they move to another host. And um, one of the problems that we have right now with, with COVID is that because we are not being careful enough, we humans, we are allowing these virus to mutate, mutate faster because they are passing from, from one uh, human to the other in, a, in an increased way. So basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say, or maybe also ask is, uh, we are helping uh, in the specific virus COVID to accelerate its evolution because of our own behavior. If our behavior was different, um, uh, th this evolution and these these new new variants of the of the virus will will be slower or maybe not, not even happen. No, because we had this this uh, delta and now is being displaced by the omicron. So it's it's the whole the whole concept of of evolution and adaptation. No, and and we are helping the thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know the idea that we're probably going to have to live with corona. In, in some way or another, just as we're living with the common cold and we're living with the flu and we're living with many other viral. Um, uh, Which is interesting. <laughs> it's interesting as well. If, if you look at from, from, from um, a, a, at least the information that we have so far about the Omicron that um, is much more contagious, but it seems to be less um, damaging, less, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the effect in the body is less, which is ideal for a virus. You, you don't want to kill your host. You just want to replicate as much as possible. Yeah. So it's, it seems that the, the Omicron is, it seems to be uh, the, the winning so far, the winning right. variant because right. of that. No? Yeah. And you, know, you might predict that that's what would happen if you introduce barriers to transmission. Right. So, you know, I mean, Paul Ewald did a lot of this type of work, uh, you know, decades ago, looking at HIV transmission and made very similar predictions that were found to be true. And, and, and the idea is that the virus has um, a number of, of priorities. The first priority is to replicate itself. This is the this is the fundamental imperative of all life is to replicate itself. At the end of the day, that's what genes do. And they create bodies like yours and mine to help them do that. Um, so it wants to replicate, but it needs to survive long enough to replicate. So one strategy is to replicate incredibly fast, which usually comes at a great cost to the host and may in fact kill it. Mm. And that's fine from the virus's point of view, as long as it has had an opportunity to transmit itself to the next generation, right? Through all the various means. and and. A lot of the, the effort around, around Corona was trying to discover what were those means. Was it by touching surfaces? Was it, was it, you know, and we discovered it was largely aerosol transmission, unlike HIV, which was through bodily fluids, right? And other mm -hmm. viruses of other mechanisms. Um, so if you have a, a, a way of being incredibly um, damaging to your host, but you still can transmit, that's fine from the virus's point of view. It doesn't have any sentimentality, right? But yeah, if no. you put barriers to transmission through um, personal protective equipment, through masking, yes. through social distancing, and all the other efforts we've done, the whole shutdown of, of the global, you know, civilization. Um, now, the, if you have a two variants coming back to that variability point in evolutionary thinking, and one variant spreads very fast but but kills its host, and the other one. Um, doesn't kill its host because it needs time before it's going to pass on to the next host. Um, it will be more benign, and you will you will through inheritance and selection find that the variant that now is in the population is the less damaging one, and that's what yeah. we're seeing with Omicron, right? And it's yeah. very predictable through evolution is that you would have a variant that um, is not is more benign. Um, doesn't kill it. And, and many people are asymptomatic. They don't even know they have the symptoms or if they do, it, it's not too bad. 
Yeah. And that that becomes the, the, the dominant solution in that ecosystem. But it's only sustained because we have vir- vaccinations and we have yeah. social distances and so on. It can go back the other way. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I'm uh, chasing a biologist. I'm, I'm trying to convince a biologist to come and, and, and chat with me in the podcast. Uh, I, I hope I, I will be able to get um, him or her, I don't know, um, and, and to discuss these t- right, topics right. in depth. But now, if, if you allow me, then why and how psychology right. is interested in this and, and yes. what our psychology has to do with yes. evolution? Yes, of course. And you know, the, the person who ironically maybe uh, first foresaw this was Darwin himself. And in, in one of his books, he said that, you know, something to the effect of, you know, one day, even psychology will be grounded upon evolutionary thinking. Um, you <laughs> okay. know, the, the 1800s wasn't that day. And it probably wasn't until the 1960s and 70s when researchers finally started to connect the dots. And, and you know, it, I think the fundamental um, idea that people need to accept is that humans are biological creatures, entities, right? And that the mind largely is a manifestation of what the brain does. Right? Uh, again, sorry? So if you think of the mind as that collection of, of cognitive and emotional uh, you know, uh, processes that, that we yes. all engage in from thinking, memory, feeling, motivation, decision-making, uh, assessments, uh, aesthetics, it, everything that makes us human is a manifestation of the mind. Yes. Right? The kind of programs that run that, that uh, allow us to be. But what is the, what is the hardware, <laughs> if I can use that bad metaphor, that allows the mind to, to function, to operate? Well, the hardware is the brain, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. we, know that, we know that if you damage the brain, it's going to have predictable consequences on how you think. You know, neuropsychology is built on the idea that if if we remove a part of the brain or if it's injured, if you have a stroke or if you have a tumor, then there are predictable uh, deficits. You might become, you know, you might have memory loss, you might have language impairment, etc. So the brain is the fundamental hardware that allows for mind to happen. But the brain is an organ of the body, no different than the heart, the kidneys, the lung, you know, the other systems. So if the brain is a is, is, is just another organ. And, and if we can accept that all the other organs, Victor, were mm-hmm. subject to evolution, that's yes. not a controversial idea, right? No. That, that, you know, the, the lungs evolved and the heart evolved and so on, then so too must, must the brain have evolved. Yes. And if, if that's okay, <laughs> if, we, if we all agree to that, then is it not reasonable that the cognitive programs that we call mind have also are also subject to those evolutionary, uh, you know, design kinds of um, manifestations. Mm-hmm. So the, if if that's true, then we should be looking for um, the kinds of things that the mind helps the, the the human species solve or the individual solve, right? Because it usually, in in most ways of thinking, it's it's about the individual. Mm-hmm. The individual is trying to replicate the genes. And so we, we develop this notion that it makes sense to say, maybe there are things that the mind does really well because it was evolved to do those things, like uh, taste good foods and, and, and reject foods that might be dangerous to us. Yes. And maybe there are things that the mind doesn't do very well, like calculus <laughs> or you know, other kinds of making complex decisions uh, about what stock to buy. Because we didn't evolve to do those complicated things. We yes. learned to do those things, right? I mean, to, it, it, let me give you another very easy uh, example. If you put a human baby in any culture in the world, no matter where that baby was born, you can take a, a, a baby born in Japan and you put it into, uh, you know, um, wherever you want, let's say G- uh, Germany, that baby will learn German. No problem, as long as it's exposed to that linguistic environment and it'll learn it without an accent and it'll speak fluent German. And you can take the German baby and put it in Japan and the same thing will happen. That German baby will learn Japanese fluently, perfectly. Um, But will a human being naturally and fluently learn how to read? No, reading is very difficult. It's effortful. You require practice, you require instruction. You need to learn rules. It takes years. Um, and so reading is not part of our biological evolutionary inheritance. It's much more part of our cultural civilizational inheritance, 
which operates by different rules. Those rules, we, we, you and I work in that system of rules. It's called the education system, yeah. right? But the, the language acquisition for verbal expression is biological. It's easy and it happens fluently. So when we ask questions of, do we see traits that are, are culturally universal, that seem to happen in culture after culture and have happened for as long as we have recorded you know, memories of them, then that's a good candidate that that's an evolutionarily psychological trait that has evolved over time that is an adaptive solution to some problem of living. And the problems yeah. okay. for humans, of course, are how do we find good food, shelter, yeah. avoid predation, avoid illness, find a mate, be attracted to the mate, uh, raise children, um, make sure that people aren't trying to deceive us. Uh, so we have we have a trust system, we have rules yes. and, and, and abilities, you know, that feeling sometimes you have when you meet someone, you say, I don't really trust this person, but I don't know why they haven't actually said anything. Yeah. But yes. maybe, maybe your mind is actually picking up on some very subtle uh, facial expressions or, or voice yes. Use or body language yeah 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 no there are there are a hundred topics that i would like to discuss with what just just said in the last few minutes and it's just fantastic it's fantastic so let's let's go one at a time um so if i understand correctly the whole idea of of of, uh, evolutionary psychology is is to understand the kind of psychological predispositions um that that you know help our ancestors basically survive and reproduce those are the yes. two main things survive yes. and reproduce yes the, the 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 complex thing here is that the, our brain uh, the human brain evolve in a in a well i i, I don't know if I, it's saying in a different way or in a way let's just put it that way like that um to create much more complex structures which we call societies and civilization which is not completely unique to humans as far as i i, I understand there are there are uh, you know group traits in other in other animals now, there are a, kind of um, um, societies if you if you allow me to say no we see that in in different in different animals in different species so one one of the things that i find i find quite interesting is is what you were saying about the the the, the brain and as just another part of an organism also evolve. I, I read a super interesting book a while ago uh, that is called uh, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. And it's, it's fascinating. It's really, really crazy because basically she, she says, I mean, it's, it's, it has tons of content. So I'm just going to pick on, 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 on a few. Um, you know, after one of these lessons after the other that is explaining how the brain works, basically is telling that we are not different from any other animal, that maybe some part of the brain or some specific traits have evolved a little bit more, but there is no, no essential difference in that aspect. But what she comes down at the end to, to say is that there are, there are basic different ability, not different, but abilities that we have evolved more and combined. And the secret here or the, the point here that makes us different from, from other, other animals is the combination of these five abilities. And I, I, I just want to read this so, and, and I get your, 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 your opinion. Um, these five abilities, as she says, that are the, the social reality that we have built, because there is this physical reality, you know, like gravity, that if, if you fall, it will hurt and that's it. But there's this social reality that we build. And this social reality is, is based on these five abilities. One of them is creativity. That again, none of these are uh, uh, unique to humans. Um, it's how we use them and how we combine them that makes us different. Uh, the single one, second one is communication. Uh, the third one is copying that, that we just, in order to learn, we just copy what others are doing. Uh, we cooperate. That for me is, is one absolutely essential topic to discuss later on as well, because um, that's been one of the most important one of the most important things in in humans to to be successful as a species is cooperation and in the last few i will say 100 years um we have focused on competition and and i'm just wondering what you know how much damage we are actually making um 
by, by this idea of competition instead of cooperation, which is one of our traits for being a successful species. And the last one that is, is uh, what I found most, most interesting is compression. And by that, she means the, the um, capacity to think um, um, abstractly and the ability to perceive meaning. And she explains this very, very simply. Um, if you can, you can teach a, a chimpanzee to understand what flowers are. No, and, and eventually we'll see flowers and we'll understand what flowers are. And um, you can also uh, learn or uh, teach a chimpanzee to, to understand what, um, I don't know if that may be true, but what a, what a, a bottle of wine may be. You know, it's, it's, it's a drink, it's to, it's to drink, and, and it's these basic things. But when, when we humans, we put together those two things, we go beyond and we think abstractly and say, oh, celebration, sure. anniversary, marriage, you know, it's, it's all these other things that are completely beyond the capacity of, of any, any species as far as we know this, 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 this moment. So this, this is the, 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 the extra level complexity in these two things, survive and reproduce. Now, it's this survival thing that we're focusing right now with this. So what, what, what are you thinking after hearing all this? What, what, uh, how you connect this with, with what we were, what well, you were saying? The first thing I would say is you're absolutely right to say that so many of the traits you see in humans, you see in other animal species. And one of the sort of you know, thinking prov provocations I give my students is find something that humans do that, you know, that is better than animals or the other way around. And pretty much everything that we do, an animal can do better. We can find an animal that runs faster and jumps higher and swims better and so on. So you're right to zone in perhaps on, on these cognitive kinds of traits, but even there, you know, the, the little black cap chickadee has a phenomenally better memory for locations than humans do because they, that's their evolutionary solution to staying in the north instead of migrating. Um, so even in cognitive capacities, we can find an animals that are, you know, many of them have better capacities than we do. So what, why are we the dominant species on planet Earth? Why are you and I having this conversation and not two dogs are having this conversation, right? You know, with glasses of brandy sitting by a fire, you know, thinking about philosophical thoughts. I haven't seen that yet, except in cartoons. So that's interesting. So I think you're right. I think we, you know, what, for me, the critical difference is that for some species, they evolve um, very specific programs to solve a, a specific problem. So, uh, you know, the, let's say a, 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 bee, a bird has to identify the correct kind of seed to eat and not as opposed to a pebble. <laughs> and then it has to figure out how to crack that nut and it has to figure out how to store it and remember where it was stored and, and so on. And that's a complex suite of behaviors that you and I couldn't do. And it's mm -hmm. evolved to do that. Um, but what it, it feels to me like what's happened to us that really started to change things is instead of giving us spe specific solutions to problems, we developed a general problem solving mind, a, 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 a set of cognitive abilities that allowed us to solve many different problems, but nothing very specifically to a, a high level of, of, of excellence. And so, it, you know, we, we, and there were certain accidents, I think, of our evolution where we have the opposable thumb, which allows us to manipulate things and make tools. Once you start to make tools, you can start to build things, right? So, you know, dolphins should probably be ruling the world, but their flippers don't allow them to build things. So they're <laughs> constantly frustrated, yes. right? They mm. can't evolve to that next level because they can't build things and those built things can't then start to take over in for, terms of their you know cultural evolution right? for example there are yeah. sorry sorry it's just this this topic of tools no and the possible thumb there are other mammals that do that no mm -hmm. this this idea of the stick to get the ants and yeah, the and all the, things. yeah right so yeah. they they this this um these other species that can can see objects around yes, them and yes, use yes, them yes, as tools. For sure. Yeah. They they don't um, let's say evolve those tools to be a bit more complex. They just right. use what they found. Um, why they you, you know there is a reason why they stop there. Why they don't Absolutely. start you know attaching yes. to sticks with a rope like we did uh, maybe a, a, a few thousand. Oh well, no, you you'll even see that behavior in crows, for example. You know, crows will okay. take will take sticks and they'll bend them to solve a specific 
problem of getting a grub. So you can get, I mean, a lot of psychologists are very inventive and they'll, they'll, they get into this race with the crows and trying to figure out more and more complex experiments to push the crow and the crow keeps solving it. <laughs> so it's got an adaptive, adaptable kind of mind for okay. visualizing a problem and then manipulating its environment with its beak and its claws and so on. And they're very clever. Um, and even the, even the chimpanzee behavior of, of introducing a, a stick into a termite mound um, and, and obtaining the termites. It's not as simple as taking a stick and poking it in and pulling it out. What, and, and there was a biologist who was watching them do this. And then he took the stick and he tried to do it. He pulled the stick out, there was nothing on it. So it turns out the chimpanzee gets a very specific length and, and width of stick. It puts it into the termite mound and then it vibrates it at a certain frequency that causes the termites to go crazy. They bite the, the stick and then it pulls it out and it, and it has a snack. But the problem is, why does it keep stopping there? And each chimpanzee, it, it, it doesn't know how to do this. It must learn to do this from its parents or from other clever chimpanzees by observational learning. And we, of course, children learn through observational learning. And we would be stuck with the chimpanzee and the crow if it wasn't for one specific thing. We figured out a way to store knowledge and to share that knowledge. It's called a library. It's called a book. It's called a written document, right? So we have an ability to transmit the knowledge that, that a genius chimpanzee human you know, equivalent has learned so that the next generation doesn't have to reinvent it. We just take from that and we build from that. There's a very famous saying from Isaac Newton that if I have seen farther than others, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Now, Isaac Newton himself was a giant, but he was referring to Galileo. He was referring to, to Copernicus. He was referring to all the great scientists before him. He didn't have to make those discoveries. He just took them and took them further. And this is what, what the history of, of civilization is really, you know, essentially the history of building on the creativity and the inventiveness and the solutions of a prior generation and keeping what worked and enhancing it and improving it and, and disregarding what, what didn't work, right? Yeah. And so that's when you leverage that um, non-biological innovation of storing knowledge and sharing it, um, which no animal species has done. So could, could we say that that's one of the, the first um, psychological tra traits that, that we can distinguish in humans as part of our evolution? So my, my whole idea is, is to then go, go down now to the psychological uh, evolved adaptations that we have. No, it's what, what we humans can identify as these um, functional products of evolution in, in, in either natural selection or, or sexual uh, selection as well. Right, right. Yes. Um, I mean, here I would say that we, you know, we have to be careful that we don't slip into an older biological determinism that evolutionary psychology has been accused of, which okay. is the idea that all of our psychological adapted traits are, are strictly biologically determined through our genes. And that oh. there's not a more complex interplay with culture and society. Of course. Yeah. Yes. So, so your context no, has plays, plays a big, big, big role. Right. And it, it gets confusing teasing those things apart because they're so intertwined with each other. Right. And, and in, in a sense, that's that's the point <laughs> mm -hmm. is that, we, we, you know, we, we, we're, it, it's, a, it's like we're trying to extend the powers of our mind. Yeah. By creating computers and smartphones yeah. and these systems that allow us to share very quickly. To, to sift through all that noise to write, to go to the signal. I mean, this is what the educational systems do, right? Fantastic. They, they take a person like you who's done a lot of the filtering and you found the signals in your field and you then pass that on to your students in a very efficient way, right? So much of, of, of what we do is, as, as, as educators is what is the most powerful way to transmit knowledge? What is the most powerful way to have the students develop insights and then they can apply those to the problems of their life or other bigger problems that they encounter? And so we're trying to condense and compress, maybe to use that word from, from the author yes. you were talking about, um, so that we don't waste time figuring it out again and again. And look at so much of what civilization is. It's about just making things faster and easier so that at the end of the day, it's just push a button and boom, we have it, we have what we want. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, let's, let's start digging there, because the, uh, the, the, the idea of, you know, biological 
uh, this, this dichotomy that you were saying, you know, about just being biological uh, traits um, and forgetting that there is a social component. Um, sometimes people talk about human nature and, and, you know, understanding that, yes, there are certainly some psychological traits, some psychological adaptations based purely in biology, but there is a heavy, heavy component on, on a so social aspect. Um, I will say, my, my, my instinct will tell me that there is no one human nature, that there may be many human natures, you know, that mm -hmm. whatever is it that we understand as, as human nature, it, it, it must be different from someone, you know, as you were saying, uh, grown in or, or raised in, in, uh, in Germany and, and the other one grown in, in or raised in, in the jungle in the middle of the Amazon. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will, will that make sense? Will, will the idea of, of not being just one human nature yeah, I mean, stand I think in any way? You know, to, one of the metaphors I use with my students is what's more important when you make a cake, the recipe or the ingredients? <laughs> and you can't answer the question, right? Because you need both. And, and so the genes, in a sense, are the, the recipe, the instructions for creating the organs and the systems. And the recipe is the environment and the culture and the input. So I can, I can give, you know, if I give you flour and sugar and butter and a few other ingredients, but I give you a different set of baking instructions, how to mix them, what temperature, you're going to produce something quite different than someone else who was given a different set of environmental instructions and, and, and context. So, you know, is there a human nature independent of context? No, human nature always um, manifests in relation to its environment. Yes. But when you keep that environment largely context, then you start to see patterns that are consistent, right? So for example, if coming back to the language, when we take a set of babies and they're in Italy, they almost all learn to speak Italian, right? That's mm -hmm. a pattern, that's a consistency because that's their environmental context. And then you go over to China and they're not all speaking Italian, they're speaking Chinese. So, but if we, if we did that switch experiment, we took the Chinese babies and Italian babies, they'll, they'll now, learn the context language so mm -hmm. there is a human nature in in this sense we are programmed to learn language the the cultural context specifies the flavor or the sound of that yes. whatever that thing is so it, you know it's like those two people looking at the number a number on the pavement and, and they're standing apart and the number six is on the pavement and one sees six and one sees yes. nine Right. So, yes. but they're both seeing something, right? Yes. They're both seeing a number. But take, taking the example of language, we can, we can, uh, I guess, extrapolate that to many other things. No, is is um, uh, talking probably about even even worldviews and moral values and all these type of things. They are all social traits. They are social construct. They are all social created, and those are the ones defining also how we evolve and how yeah, we yeah, you yeah. know uh, survive and reproduce as well um there are there's so many things i'll i'll need to move move on a little bit here um because as as i i, I in my audience if if they if they um, have heard other of uh, how they're all heard other episodes i i normally follow three main topics the idea of change long-term thinking and limits and i mean the, the these are very broad conceptual philosophical approaches to your understanding and your field. So talking about change in, in, in from my understanding of, of psychology and evolutionary psychology, one of the things that, that strike me the most is you mentioned, you no, know, an evolution is about change. It's always changing. I have talked about, um, you know, um, change with paleoecologists and astronomists and, and change is constant in, in, every corner of the universe and in our planet, in every single thing. But humans, we have, I don't know if this is a constant for, from, you know, long-term or it's, it's a recently, it's a recent thing. Um, but we humans, we are scared of change. Socially speaking, we reject change and we, we want certainty and we want security. And I, I must imagine, I imagine that there may be some, some evolutionary thing behind it. So what, what will be your take on that? 
I, I would challenge the first premise that we um, we're scared of change and we don't like uncertainty. <clears throat> I think um, we are pulled between two forces, and there's a so if we look at how how um, children interact with food across cultures, they show what's called neophobia, a fear of the new, right? But they also show curiosity, <laughs> and so we humans are omnivores. There, are, we love food. And we love food from different cultures. Otherwise, all the restaurants in Vancouver wouldn't make sense. And all the food shows wouldn't make sense. And the cookbooks and the blogs and so on. And people love, when they travel, they love to, you know, experience the food of another culture. And we break bread together. And that's how we trust each other and so on. And if we all we did was, you know, like a koala bear, all we did was eat eucalyptus leaves and tried nothing else. I don't think human civilization would be what it is. Oh, and yeah, for sure. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be traveling and we wouldn't be as, as nutritionally excellent as we are because we can exploit so many different foods just go to your local supermarket and you see yes. right There's, other than rats i can't think of many other species that eat as as a diverse diet as we do right yeah no food is a huge component for sure yeah so if people didn't like change how would we explain that that makes no sense Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true for other things, too, for, for music yeah. and for, you know, for in, in the arts and, and, and so many things. So we're, we're, we have two tensions. Now, with food, you want to try new foods, but you want to be very careful when you do it. Mm -hmm. So if you watch a baby with a new food, it kind of smells it, puts it in its mouth and rejects it immediately if, it's, if it doesn't like it. And then maybe it watches the parent and maybe you have to cut it differently. Uh, or you have to present it differently or put a little bit of salt or things like that or pair it with another food and then you expand the repertoire. Most kids hate beer and yet beer sales amongst adults are pretty healthy. What happened developmentally there? So we have mechanisms to, to love new things also, to explore, to embrace change, et cetera. And in fact, you know, when we learn, learning is in, in, it is a deep parallel to evolution because learning is also about adapting to environments, but it's on a, 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 a narrow time scale and it's only in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, but with learning, when humans learn, when you're learning something you love, Victor, don't you feel happy and you seek more information and you're, you're, you're falling asleep to, to the yeah. book and, and so on. And, and so, you know, you get this kind of endorphin high when you learn new information. When, and you get yeah. rewarded with dopamine, you know, because it feels good and, there is, and so on. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but I, I, I don't want to lose the, 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 the thread that you opened there. Um, so I, I, I agree, obviously, that there are, there are things that we are always open to change. I try to be as, 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 as logic as possible and try not to generalize. But there are there are some topics that I I just wonder if if this applies as well this broadly because for example when when there is something new that you you would like to try on on your own decision there may be some sense of fear but overcoming that fear probably gives you that that rush probably there is a I'm probably sure that there will be a dopamine release or something there when you succeed in that in that change. You now, when you are afraid of something, taking a trip or learning something new or going somewhere that you've never been before, or whatever, um, there is a, a, a sense of fear. But it's your own decision. Is is for some reason you are deciding to go there. But there are other other situations where change happens when you don't want it. And it could be something, for example, like a, a catastrophe, you know, is, is yeah. uh, something that is uh, like we had here in, in British Columbia uh, uh, in November, what you were saying, the, 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 the rain, no, we had floods. And now the, the, uh, the discussion is, should we rebuild or should we just build somewhere else? No, and, and you have families that have been living there for generations that say, no, this is my house. Why, why should I change? No, and, and these, these, uh, ideas of tradition maybe uh comfort yeah. that somehow we are seeking i understand that comfort and we can even go beyond that like luxury and 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 wealth and all that are social constructs that we pursue because someone told us that we should pursue it you know those are the ones that i think are are 
at least some in my mind that that are somehow people rejecting change. If you say to someone, yeah. no, no. I think I, the idea I want to introduce here is that we don't have yes. one mind. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you know, and some people are out of their mind, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, we have different states of mind. This is okay. this is profound. It, it, yes. It's like the, you know, the Airbus uh, air, aircraft have flight rules depending on what the plane is doing. And the, and the, the same programs operate differently depending on what you need the plane to do. Yes. And we have these, these mind rules that operate differently depending on what's happening. So this morning, when I came down to, to make my, my wonderful espresso, <laughs> um, my fish tank was making a noise. I went and the water was overflowing onto the floor. Ah, okay. This is, uh, this is my private little flood of the Fraser Valley happening in real time. <laughs> and Victor, I haven't had my coffee yet. So this is, this is very bad. Because now my mind has gone into to sympathetic nervous system panic mode, right? And humans have these two modes, parasympathetic, slow, calm, deliberate, and sympathetic fight or flight. So the only options are you run away, or you get paralyzed with fear, or you fight. And okay. I went into yes. that mode, and there's a little, um, there's a little uh, intake valve on the top, and I pulled it out. Because when you are in a panic mode, you really, you think in binary terms, right? Mm -hmm. Pulling it out made the problem worse because it now meant all the water could pour in even faster. What I needed to do was to, to just to pull it up so the water couldn't get in to the, the filter. But I pulled it out. And now, now what was a small trickle was a flood. So then I went into secondary panic mode and I just pulled the plug out, just cut power, killed the thing, right? Um, and, you know, that's what happens in road rage right? What is, you, you now use your vehicle as a weapon, right? You know, or, or someone confronts you in the bar and you get a bottle or something. We go into, and then we regret that. So when you ask the, a person who's in a, in, a, in a catastrophe, should you rebuild or not? It's not a fair question because many of them are going to say, no, of course not. I'm going, I'm, they're in panic mode. They're going to stay where they are because that's safe. Home has always been safe to them. What does it mean to go somewhere else? You're, you're adding uncertainty on top of uncertainty. But after the flood, when things are controlled and contained and you sit them down and you say, let's do a forensic analysis of what happened and let's look at the climate models and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Is this going to happen again? Or was it a once in a lifetime thing? And now people are much more able to make an informed, rational decision. Hmm. Some psychologists call this type two thinking, systems thinking, the system one, uh, system two. Kind of um, yes. It's more deliberate, it's more rational. And that's been the hallmark of our species too, is that ability to take the long view, to be very thoughtful, to collect data, to look for patterns, and then to make a very educated, uh, rational decision about what's in, in my long-term interest, the community, the nation, do, do we? Do we really... I mean, it, it sounds, it sounds, I agree with you completely, but if I look out there, maybe I'm biased, I'm for sure biased, but if, if I look at the state of the world, I, I don't see humans making rational decisions. And, and you know, you know the, the field of, of behavioral economics and all the, the, the um, precisely the cognitive bias that they have discovered in the last 10, 20 years, we are far from being rational, no? Look, a bias is not inevitability. A, a bias moves you away from what's what's the best path, right? It, it colors your thinking, it prejudices your behavior. But if you can become aware of bias, uh, which which requires you know cool thought and and listening to other people, what we're doing, right? Yeah. Um, and, and and considering alternative points of view and maybe doing simulations and scenarios. Mm -hmm. So I think what you really see, Victor, is both. The problem is people see what they want to see because that also is a, is a cognitive bias, right? You know, the, yes. the, the heuristic bias, the you know, various uh, filters that we have, et cetera. And, and those themselves often get activated during times of anxiety and stress. Um, so, you know, you see nations coming together, communities coming together to help each other, uh, to cooperate, to share resources. Um, you had the, the Gurdwaras here in Surrey were airlifting food to the Fraser Valley to people that they didn't know, to communities that they you know, hadn't had a history with um, because that was part of their cultural value of, of charity and generosity. And, and many other examples of individuals too, too numerous to count. So I think we see both. We see cooperation, we see elements of altruism, 
we see long-term thinking, uh, but we also see je jealousy and selfishness and, and you know, cruelty and, and very in individualistic types of traits. Mm -hmm. um, and remember too, we live in a country that's largely based on individualistic culture, right? Mm -hmm. in, in other parts of the world, it's much more biased towards collectivist culture. So, so there the, the thinking might be different as well. So we have to be aware of the water we're in. But I, I think there's, there's examples on both sides. And, and the question for me is, which one are we privileging? Which one are we uh, teaching? Which one are we enforced, you know, uh, uh, um, emphasizing? And, 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 and hopefully that's the one that, that overtakes the, the, the more basic primal um, it, it sort of selfish tendencies. So you mentioned long term. Let's go there because time is flying. We're almost an hour in. Um, so in terms of long-term thinking, um, you mentioned that there is, the, there is this trait of looking at the future, uh, trying to find patterns. And I guess this is, this is one of those things that are basically for survival. You know, is, is the idea of, of uh, trying to understand what the, the dangers may be. The idea you know, is that is a tiger is going to jump at me out of that bush or, or I'm, I'm safe to go. In, in terms of long-term thinking and, and maybe going a little bit beyond just the, the pure evolutionary aspect, bio, biological side, the more the, the, the social and the cultural, what, what the long-term thinking, how you see long-term thinking now in, in our nowadays society and, and, and this psychological evolutionary trait that we have. I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, are, are we being moved away from what we, we should be doing? I, I feel that we have been equipped through this evolution to precisely see that long-term thinking, but there are certain realities in, in, in our in societies right now, specifically politics and economics, that are completely, what you were saying, individualistic and short-termist. Is, is like, what is going to happen in the next six months? You know, how I'm going to produce profits for my shareholders in, in, the, in this year and who cares what's happened next? I, I see kind of a, a, a dichotomy there. What, 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 how can we make sense of that? I think that dichotomy has always been there, but the consequences of the dichotomy are greater <laughs> than ever before. Mm. You know, um, I mean, you know, we have a history coming back to evolution of tribalism, right? And we kind of took care of our members of our own tribe and we knew there were members of our own tribe because they looked like us, skin color, hair color, the body paint that they use, the language they spoke, so, so we knew. Um, and then the other tribe we were kind of suspect of because they probably wanted to, you know, take our resources or, or, or take, you know, members of our tribe away. But then some tribes might have, have developed these complex rules to cooperate and maybe can I go through your territory and I'll give you a gift in order to do that and maybe we could share or maybe we could form an alliance against a third tribe and so you have, now you have to figure out how to trust that tribe for the time being and we're still doing that at the united nations right <laughs> you know russia and united states will cooperate on one thing and then they're you know pointing guns at each other on another thing so it's all about you know uh what is important to you at the time um so i think that tension of cooperation competition is built into us and it's and we live on a finite planet where things aren't distributed equally so yeah. it, now it's the hunger games and squid game all put together um, but we've, we have examples of building things that are durable and that enhance everyone. We have um, a healthcare system that every one of us can access in Canada, at least, right? Regardless of your income level, regardless of, the, of your tribal affiliation, regardless of the language you speak. That's a remarkable thing. We have an educational system that because you and I are educators, we think is broken, but in fact is actually pretty good. Right. It could be much better, but it's actually pretty good on, on, a, on a global scale. Uh, we have transportation systems that kind of work. I know you love transportation and you probably think otherwise, but actually it gets people from A to B. Could it do it better? Of course it could. Um, so many of our systems work and they work precisely because we have given up individual considerations and we've said yeah. this is for the societal good through taxation, through, you know, who we vote for and how we, you know, uh, make our purchasing decisions and so on. So that's what we need to encourage. That's what we need to enhance and motivate and, and so yeah. on. And we can do that through our teachings in our families. We can do that through the kinds of politicians and leaders in, in business and elsewhere that we, we you know, elect or, or 
support um, and through the kinds of education that we are teaching. Classic. Okay. I mean, there, there is maybe one last thing I wanted to talk about that that is different for us today than than many of our ancestors, and that is, you know, mm -hmm. technology. Yeah. Right. And and I think evolutionarily we we were very good at looking at linear change, mm -hmm. right? And and linear change is at one, two, three, four, five. But now with technology, we have exponential change. Yes. So two becomes four, and four becomes eight, and eight becomes sixteen. And to wrap our heads around that, we're not built for that. That's a mathematical construct that we have to learn. And it's still really hard in your bones yes. to figure out what does that mean? But now with the rise of artificial intelligence and big data and all of these other, you know, IOT, internet of things and converging technologies, um, we are now in a very different place where the technology is smarter than the mind, any one mind, maybe than all of our minds together. The internet yeah. knows everything but it doesn't know it with wisdom it just has it's just a collection of data and facts but what happens when you have intelligent systems that are now able to make judgments able to make decisions right uh, a drone can make a decision to kill someone without any human input we have to construct laws to say we're not going to allow that but it could do that right um there's an ai program that can detect uh tumors in in x-rays chest x-rays and it does it not only better than a doctor, it does it better than a radiologist. In fact, it does it better than a thoracic radiologist. It has a higher accuracy rate than the most well-trained human specialist. And that's already today. Mm -hmm. And that is improving and improving on such a small time scale. Yeah. That, that's, that one, I'm not sure what the solution is to. You know. Yeah, so I guess we, we, we'll go there into, into that, that part of, of um... I, I will see that as part of the limits. Um, let's let's chat about it in a moment. I would just just like to wrap up um, what what we were discussing before. You no, know, what you were saying about the tribalism, that yeah, for sure is is something that is is intrinsic in our nature, and I I, I think we could say that the the reason the main reason is is because the resources are scarce, and you have to ensure the survival of your group at least. You no. Know? My, my worry right now is that I would like to believe that humans, we have created now enough knowledge to understand that tribalism in the larger sense for, for the survival of the species uh, could be detrimental. And what, I'm, what I'm, I'm, I have in my mind is, is you know, the biggest challenge that we have in, in, in our future as a species is climate change. And I, I think that this will be probably the first time in which we all really need to get together and get along and organize. Because if we don't have a, a, a coordinated res response to this challenge, um, the impact is going to be massive. And obviously there are, there are some that the impact will be more damaging than others. Normally, those others that will be less damaged are the wealthy and better prepared. And what, what, I'm, what I'm worried is to see some people thinking, well, yeah, I mean, we can just build a wall, you know, and go get those people uh, out of here or avoiding those people coming here. And, and that is a very, very um, uh, narrow view, you no, know, because there is there is no wall that can stop, you know, people when they are they are suffering and they are in distress. So looking at the the, the pandemic, for example, now, you no, know, is what what many are saying that no one is going to be safe until everybody is safe. And we are seeing in countries like Israel and and I think US that are giving the fifth, I think even the sixth doses which i i understand why they do it it's completely logical but then you have countries that they have one percent of their population vaccinated and following the, what we were discussing before about the, the how the virus reacts and, and and the idea of evolving and so on we are just we are just giving them giving the chance to the the virus to to do its thing you no know? and so that that's what my mind is is going into into this idea of exploring uh, the evolutionary psychological traits in humans to understand that there may be some limits and then we can just I guess jump into that 
that that we we need to be aware of our, our own our own limitations. Um, so if 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 I propose we can maybe do two 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 routes in this topic. One will be if 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 you agree. What what do you think could be the limitations, the actual physical, cognitive, psychological limitations for us to understand that um, we we really need to change and do this really long term thinking in order to survive as a species, but also the 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 idea that maybe we can overcome these limits with technology and maybe we can talk about what what you are doing with uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and. Uh, the good and bads. I mean, I, I, I certainly, I'm, I'm certainly interested in, in, in all the really amazing things. I have had a, a couple of experience with virtual reality, and mind blowing. It's fantastic, and I think it can solve tons of problems. But there is also a dark side, no, and 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 some some very important limits that we should we should not cross. So these these two things, if we can go first with the with the the, the known limits of our own cognition and then jump into how can technologies help us yeah great it's a great path you know when i teach now I, I teach in two different ways one i'm teaching online so we're using this technology and i sometimes will have my my laptop open and i'll have a second laptop because the first one is for the video conference call but uh -huh. the second one is to access notes and information and websites and then i might even have my ipad because i might need to look at some you know other information so I, I, what's happened is my my brain which is limited in its ability to remember and its ability to you know uh make sense of things has been enhanced right because these technologies which are designed by humans to work with us so that's good um, have expanded my intelligence. I'm much smarter because of my technology in a real way, I think. Um, and that's a profound thing. It, it, and it, and it, it's, you know, I, I, this is why it's important to give students access to mind enhancing technologies, uh, but also to teach them how to use it and what are the limits, of course, because it really does improve your ability. So I, I'm learning how to do woodworking, uh, Victor but I've not taken any formal training. What I had was an original love of it and, and the sensuality of wood and working with your hands, but I'm enhancing my understanding by watching countless YouTube videos. Just self-education, people yes. putting together a little package, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Sometimes the guy speaks too slowly, so I'll put it on one and a half times the speed so I can get the information I want. That ability to personalize learning and to get exactly what I want, to find the signal amongst all the noise, and there's already love and motivation there, that can really dramatically break the barriers and the cognitive constraints that we all have, because we only have so much intelligence, so much memory, so much ability to understand, make sense of, have insights, et cetera. And we have our limitations, right? You know, like I, I'm, I understand math, but only to a certain point, not like some really good mathematician. I love music, but I don't have the musical capabilities of a, of a musician. But nonetheless, through learning, through technology, I can enhance my abilities dramatically. So I think that would be, um, would be my answer to the question of what do we do with the problem that we have this, you know, one and a half kilogram, you know, brain inside a skull, and how do you expand it? And short of, of putting actual neural implants, which some people are working on, right? Which will- Musk is proposed right. something and, like and that. What is he, he, just like the matrix, he's saying you can learn a language in a few seconds and you can get a bachelor's degree in maybe a few minutes. Uh, it'll be, you know, what's your download speed? I don't know <laughs> if that's true or not, but maybe. Um, I have some, some serious doubts, but- Well, of course, on. yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, but, you know, I, I suppose a, a hundred, 200 years ago, they had serious doubts about airplanes, too. <laughs> oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if you, if you put, you know, put metal wings, how will that fly? <laughs> so uh, I'll be agnostic about that. Okay. But, uh, but my point is that that's how you break through the barriers, right? You break through it through learning, through techno with technology, the right technology at the right time, put together in the right way. And then you can really expand your abilities dramatically. So I'm, I'm sorry, just jumping here, one, one crazy idea. I was, I was chatting with um, paleocologists um, as part of this podcast. 
And uh, I was asking one one question about you know the 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 future. And she also she, she mentioned obviously the 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 clear idea that humans as a species will continue to evolve. You know, and it's something that is unstoppable. Um, I'm I'm talking about really long term, like thousands or even millions of years if we manage to survive. Um, but th th this idea that we will evolve. Now, thinking about these this implants and, this, uh, and the technology, how do you see the idea of humans evolving thanks, thanks to technology and becoming you know, a species of cyborgs? What will happen with our biology, biological yeah. aspect of, right. of human? I draw a distinction between biological evolution and technological evolution. And I think for humans, our biological evolution has slowed down dramatically. I don't think it's stopped. I think there's still evidence of it, again, because you know, we have a lot of variability in the human species and we're distributed across a planet that has very different uh, environmental contexts. So you have groups that are adapting to their context. Yeah. And there's lots of evidence of that. There are small subsets in, in Southern Africa, for example, where large segments of the population are largely immune to HIV. Correct? Okay. Um, and there's many other examples, you know, the sickle cell anemia example from Western Africa to, to the United States with the slave trade. Um, so we can, we can definitely find examples of microevolutionary differences across the world, which says that humans are still evolving. But we're not evolving as a species, we're evolving in pockets because that's what evolution is. Evolution doesn't, you know, it's not like we go from the iPhone 5 and suddenly everyone has an iPhone 6. We still have people with iPhone 5s and some with the 10s and some with the Android and some with no phone at all. And so, you know, it, it has everyone evolved? No, it's all unequal distribution like William Gibson, right? The, um, the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed. So we have... Um, we have examples, clear examples of biological evolution, but because we have largely figured out how germs work, because we have functional healthcare systems, because we don't allow people to just die when they lose a job and they go on the streets, that still happens, but largely in most, many of the, the you know, economies in the world and the nations, we have systems to prevent you from having catastrophic loss. And what that means is you can survive and you can reproduce. And as long as you can do that, you have short-circuited evolution, right? If a child yeah. has cancer and you, you cure the cancer or you slow the, the rate of the cancer long enough for them to get into adulthood and they reproduce, any of the genes that might have made them susceptible to that cancer will also get transmitted to the next generation. In other words, you don't have evolution. You have slowed evolution because the, the, the death of that child would have altered the evolutionary pathway. And I'm, not, I'm certainly not suggesting that yeah. we don't take no. care of kids with cancer. I'm, I'm suggesting the opposite. No. I'm simply saying there's a cold logic to how evolution works. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're going to sustain it. It's important, it's important to distinguish the moral and ethical aspect of what we do and, the, and the cold, you know, simple way. I'm, that I'm biology describing works. it like an alien who has come yes, to the planet exactly. and, is, and is interested in the mm -hmm. ecology of the planet. And, but with the technological evolution, that's ex going at the exponential rate. It's going in all different directions. And it, but of course, it impacts our, our biology. When you put yes. your, your body in um, a 2000 pound you know, vehicle that moves at 100, 200 kilometers an hour. Um, that's a very interesting collaboration of biology and technology in one. And when that car crashes, if it crashes, your biology doesn't do well because it wasn't evolved to do well in that scenario. Of course. Right? And so we have so many examples of this. You know, think of cigarettes, which are designed to be addictive and then all the healthcare effects that they have and our, our distracted yeah. cell phones and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't, we, here's what we haven't done very well. We haven't integrated the, the biology, psychology, sociology with all of the, the technology. That interface is very rough and usually at the cost to us. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. This is this is one topic that I normally discuss with with my students and I have talked about it with uh, other guests in the podcast and friends or in general, the, the idea that biology in the planet is is relatively simply to, simple to understand. No, you go through uh, thermodynamics and, and the trophic levels No, is, is uh, plants and herbivores and carnivores and how energy moves and matter moves from one level to the other. And uh, I normally give the example with uh, rabbits and wolves. No, you need to have more rabbits than wolves. Otherwise, the wolves won't have enough food and the wolves will die. So when too many wolves go mm-hmm. inhabit and they mm-hmm. kill too many rabbits, mm-hmm. suddenly wolves won't have enough food and right, right. They, yeah. some of them will have to die because yeah. there is no food until the population of the rabbits recuperate and grows again. Right. And right. So population in that aspect, in, 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 in the natural world, populations are not necessarily static. They, they, they fluctuate, mm-hmm. you know, and we humans, we broke those rules. We, right. we, we don't know how it may look a fluctuation in our population. Right. And that is something that I haven't heard anybody talk about mm-hmm. because it has so many big, big implications in our social construct. Mm-hmm. We are built, we have built our society and economies and everything for continuous growth. Mm-hmm. And obviously it's, it's, it's impossible. We know that in, uh, in, for several reasons, population will, will stabilize in, you know, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, but it will stabilize. And we have no idea absolutely what on earth to do with our economy and other things. But right, that will be right. other topics that we'll discuss later yeah, on. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but my point that I normally do is that we have broken those rules. We have moved beyond those rules. And I'm, again, just like you said, I'm not suggesting that we should go back and just let people die and all that. What I'm saying is that knowing that there are these rules and that we have broken them, we should be also building our systems, our structures, and our societies to cope with the consequences of that, you know, because there are evident consequences. And I, I found that people don't really want to see that and don't want to talk about that. And they yeah. just want to, you know, move, move on trying to, to maximize everything in their personal right. lives. Right. It, it's hard to think like that, right? I, again, we're, our, our minds aren't equipped to think that way. Long-term, massive implications, the interconnections of things, and then the unforeseen things that inevitably happen. And you know, it, 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 so much of our history is we invented technology and then suddenly it has unforeseen uses, right? So, you know, remember the first smartphones, they were, they were a brick and they were just used for you and I to communicate. And then someone thought, well, what if we added this other function and this other function? And now this device, it's not even, it's not descriptively accurate to call it a phone because that when you look at how people use it in terms of percentage of time, using it as a phone is like number four on the list, right? They're using it as an internet device and as a camera and for social media access, those are the top (laughs) criteria. So you should call it that. Um, But that ability to converge it into one thing that no one anticipated And then that created a huge market for apps and app developers, right? And now people, their entire career and and employment is developing the small little thing that allows you to do something on this device. So the the unpredictability and unforeseen aspect of of what happens when when technologies merge together and start to dance, that one's almost impossible to predict, other than to say it will happen and be prepared (laughs) to deal with that and how will we adapt Yes. to that inevitability. It will happen that electric cars will take over from ice cars. It will happen that our homes will become intelligent and they'll control their own temperature and their own air and they'll, and they'll order food for you and the fridge is empty and that will create new jobs and new structures and the food will deliver to you by a drone. <laughs> and, you know, and we can start to just imagine those futures and they sound science fiction-y, but they're already happening in certain places, right? Yeah, yeah for um, sure. So, you know, to, to say, okay, what's inevitable? We, we know that technology is going to become integrated in our lives in more inevitable ways, in, in smarter ways, and that jobs that we thought were protected because they only a human could do it, that's wrong, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it can, it, it's, it's just a question of time. In any position, any job can be done diff- better than, a, than a, an, an AI-enhanced ha- system. Yeah. Um, so that's your, okay, so what's next? How do we, you know, place ourselves? 
Yes. So what uh just to, to close we are we are uh, almost one hour and a half in and um we need to start closing I, this is so fascinating i could talk for hours with you of course um the um probably you have seen the uh the movie i think it's called ready player one yes ready player uh one. have you seen it i have yeah well, like yeah it. so you have these this entire uh, uh world built in in the um digital world right and you have also you know not only the the classic goggles but the whole suit that that makes you feel and and you can move in a platform and everything and and it's very interesting from from a, from a technology aspect but also from a, a moral and ethical aspect no uh, from a sociology aspect this this movie because they are talking about a world that has lost in many ways their human aspect, the humanity of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it has a moral, you know, at the end that says that, well, we need to close this, this, uh, this world at least once a week so everybody can go back to reality and live mm -hmm. the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's a movie and they are just exploring these topics. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm, I wanted to go now is to the meta, what Facebook is doing. And, and yes, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, the, the, the whole thing is approaching to that. No, I mean, it's, it's looking that is, is going in that direction. Um, you, are, you are working on, on this virtual and, and, and augmented reality. Uh, do you really think that that is, is a possible future? Are we somehow equipped psychologically to accept and evolve in that direction or or do you think is is there is there will come out the need for a mediation for a for a for a not total immersion in that that uh, digital reality i don't know if i'm making any sense yeah yeah i think you are and i I'm, i've been thinking the same sort of confusing thoughts as well um to me it's as inevitable as any other technology from you know remember when people rode hard horses right and cars were where people thought if you went faster than 30 kilometers an hour you wouldn't be able to breathe and you'd die uh, you know? and 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 you know my love for aviation and still when i look at a plane flying i'm still in shock and awe that this is real yes. um and my yes. smartphone and my ipad and my laptops and all of this stuff um you know it amazes me and but it just becomes more and more amazing uh, because it becomes more and more powerful. I think it was the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke who said that any technology when first introduced, you know, is indistinguishable from magic, <laughs> right, to when you first encounter it. And then you, it just becomes part of your background, right? So right now I can, I can shout out, I can say, Alexa, play Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and Beethoven's Fifth Symphony will fill my apartment. How is that not magic, Victor? And yet it's just, it's now mundane and it's banal, right? Um, and we, it's amazing how quickly we forget. So right now from our vantage point, thinking that people will just have uh, a, a contact lens that they put into their eye maybe, and that will give them full extended reality access, VR, AR, MR, all of it with internet connectivity and, and your phone and your computer, it will all be in that little implant. Maybe it'll be actually implanted, so you don't even have to take the contact lens in and out. It'll be like, yeah. a, you know, they do the, the, the laser surgery on your eye. It'll be painless, or maybe it'll just be a tiny injection. Who knows? Um, and imagine that you didn't have to carry your device. So hardware has become irrelevant, right? And you just have, and there's a little chip, you know, on, behind your ear, and that gives you LTE communication yeah. with not 5G speed, but 10G speed. It's just insane. So you are a cyborg. Right to come back to your earlier point, you have now the the human and the machine have merged indistinguishably from each other. Your heat is is powering the technology, and the technology is is you know connecting with you and anticipating your hunger before you have it, and already ordering the food. So by the time you realize you're hungry, the burger is already being delivered to you by a drone, <laughs> and it's personalized and tailored and bespoke and everything. That's the future we're going to many elements of already exist it hasn't all been stitched together seamlessly uh look how yeah. fast we adapted with with covid you can now get home deliveries of food and amazon and all of that and we're doing we move remember yeah. we move from from in-person teaching to online teaching in 48 hours in an institution that is designed not to change <laughs> and i'm not being <laughs> ironic right it's designed not to change yes in i 48 hours 
Not, I get it. It didn't do yeah. it well, but it did it. And then yes. incrementally it'll improve. So with VR, AR, it's absolutely here to stay. It will get better and better according to Moore's law or other exponential growth curve laws. Um, yeah. Right now, the limitations are it, the equipment is expensive. It's, it, it feels cumbersome to wear a VR headset. It's glitchy. The resolution and the latency rates aren't very good. Yeah. You have to download programs. But that so will change. It, it requires, yeah, we, you know, we still feel like a cyborg, right? With Picard was connected with the wires and stuff like that, it had the red eye. But when someone is experiencing VR, AR, but you don't know that they are, you can't tell that they are, that's an interesting place to be because mm. it's just, it's just as easy as, as, you know, whistling or blinking your eye or whatever. It's just seamlessly yeah. part of an extension yeah. of how you behave. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back to the point you were saying, the ethical dimensions of this and the mm. other implications, those are very, very frightening because this stuff is powerful. This stuff is, you know, it's fueled, by, it's octane, it's, it's, you know, cocaine, it's, it's all of these things that enhance it and nuclear powered, right? And the mind is still the brain that evolved you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago. There's a, there's a saying that we, we have a stone age mind living in modern times, right? So Just, the, the yeah. evolution was, was designed for the Pleistocene, yeah. right? 10,000, 100,000 years ago, as you approach me, I say, are you a friend or are a foe, right? And I put my hands up to show that I, I'm not going to injure you. And then we have a small interaction. And we have all of those rules of who to trust and what we should do in a situation, how do you port those rules into the metaverse, which has its own rules that have evolved in bizarre ways? And, and even when I watch my son um, playing video games with others, and so I have no idea what the rules are, what the codes are, what the culture is. I would be eaten alive if I went into that universe, right? Um, and he's figured it out in, in months and, and just a few short years. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to so, sound like anti-technology. I'm, I'm actually quite interested in, 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 in imagining these, these type of futures. And I think technology is a, is a fantastic thing to, to, to use as a tool because technology is, is that, it's a tool that allows us to do things. What I'm, what I'm mostly worried is about the lack of critical thinking about the purpose. So what are, why are we doing this? Right. Uh, we are going extremely fast and, and yep. I don't see enough um, uh, reflection and discussions about uh, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? And what are the possible consequences in the ways that we are doing this? Should we do something about it now before it reaches into a much more complex state and it's harder to change? And my, my main fears is that I, I heard this term in, uh, terminology from, uh, from an economist, Janus, Janis Varoufakis, is the techno-feudalism that seems that we are moving into or we are already in. The idea that you have companies like Amazon, no, you just mentioned Alexa, and when you when, when you, Farhad Dastur, um, speak about Beethoven, you are giving all this information to Amazon about who you are and what you want, and they are building an image of you in order to sell what they think you may want. And that's, that's the idea of techno-feudalism, no? is it's the idea that you have become, we all have become a product. We, we are becoming now the, the peasants, in a world where you have these feudal masters that own, in this case, is the digital world. And the worry is that the digital world is outside any, or mostly any, any government um, uh, supervision or, 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 or rules, no? Um, I, I heard a while, I don't know what has happened, but I heard a while ago that, uh, again, Facebook was trying to create some sort of coin, some sort of monetary, um, to exchange within this digital world of Facebook, and is is you know is allowing to the creation of worlds, digital worlds, in which we will be losing. I don't know how not sound dramatic, but you know our humanity and our freedoms and our identities and a bunch of things. And on top of that, what I'm worried is that 
these, these worlds that have been created with all their algorithms and all these things that at the end is someone, someone behind drives the algorithm, you know, and, and this someone or some ones, they all have, you know, biases and they all have, you know, social constructs in their heads and, and whatever they build are building their image, you know, and most of these super mega structures that being Amazon, Facebook, um, um, Google, Apple, they are all US West Silicon Valley, mostly based in, in mostly uh, white male uh, um, institutions. And I, I am I'm particularly worried about the diversity, cultural diversity lost because of that. You know, there are some communities in, you know, in, I don't know, in Philippines, on the other side of the planet, or, you know, I don't know, Papua New Guinea, that they rely on Facebook and market Facebook to do their daily lives. And, and they are using a platform that was not created on their image and on their needs. So they are, they are also adapting and evolving and changing according to the rules set by someone else. And I don't think, I don't feel that's fair. I think that there is a danger in the loss of cultural diversity and that cultural diversity is extremely important for the resilience as well of this planet and the species as well, no? So I don't know, I'm, I'm probably just hitting like <laughs> too many things at once, but I, that's, that's what I'm seeing with, with these technologies and, 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 and these worries of, are we stopping and thinking far ahead enough to see what dangers could be and doing things now in order to avoid those things? I'm not against digital universes. Of course. I'm not against uh, virtual reality and going in and, 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 and breaking the limits of our human cognition and psychology. I'm, I'm okay with that. But based on what? For what reasons? Who is behind ruling the game? And all these, all these things that... I don't see really anybody really paying paying attention to it, and there are many other topics there. But I'll I'll just leave you for the with the final word. What just I just said, and then I jump to the final question. Any well, any there's, there's a hundred there's a thousand questions in there. They're all interesting ones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this notion of Pandora's box, and you open the box, and these you know all these ills come out. But Pandora has uh, the, the twin of panacea, which is also all the good things that come out. And so for every one of the technologies of history, there have been good things and there have been bad things. With the invention of nuclear fission, we, had, we got nuclear power, mm -hmm. which is you know, clean and abundant and, and, and largely climate neutral. But we have the problem of radioactive waste, of course, and radioactivity in a damage. So that's the Pandora part. Um, you know, even even something as simple as a knife. I mean, how how has a knife helped people with surgery, with cutting in the kitchen, but also has been used to stab and and to hold up people? And you know, so so much of the technology is what we do with it. The technology per se is yeah. neutral, largely. Um, and the answer is yes and no. Of course, it's inevitable. Once a technology gets out there and it's powerful, powerful people will gravitate towards it. Psychopaths will use it to engage in, in improving their net worth and their influence and their power. I, I yes. truly believe that the reason Elon Musk wants to go to Mars is not only to have option B for planet Earth, which is absurd, totally you, ridiculous. Yes. It's absurd, right? yes. I think he wants to rule Mars. That sounds ri ridiculous, but look at him. Everything he does is ridiculous, right? And, and, and has been. And, and what's to stop him? The Earth laws will not, will not apply on another planet. What's to stop him from saying, I now control Mars and I have the power and the means to do it and to enforce it. That's the level that we're now getting at. Um, and then he might, he won't even populate it with humans, he'll populate it with AI robots. And so, so he'll become the demigod of a, a robot civilization on another planet. That's a pretty cool thing if you're a geek, right? Yeah, but, yeah. I imagine people you know, getting very excited and saying, yes, let's go for it. Or yes, go, and, well, or and, go. And, right, and sign me up. Um, so yeah, we, because of exponential growth, these science fiction-y thoughts are all within the realm of the possible. And, and, and in fact, it's worse than that. It's within the realm of the inevitable. These things will inevitably happen. I saw this with EV cars, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, when, when, when you have a car that saves you money and is good for the environment, largely depending on how you do the primary that, energy generation, it's going to take over, right? Mm -hmm. Because people don't want the old system. And so the only question is how fast will it do it? And what are the yeah. legal and social and economic hurdles to get there? But, but going that, that's why I, I find psychology and cognition so extremely important because we need to understand the way we understand reality and perceive our context and react as well from our own limitations with all our biases and so on. Because, yeah, I, I completely agree. You no, know, technology is a tool and there are goods and bads. But now we, I mean, we have the capacity to foresee the bads and to do something to, I'm not saying avoiding them maybe, but at least lessen them. Um, and the rationality, the rationality behind that, that thinking process is not, I don't see it anywhere. I don't, I don't really see. And, and there is more economic incentive to do things like that than, than truly rational thinking or critical thinking to see what is the solution that we really should be pursuing for multiple reasons. And the electric car is just another one. Yeah. No, I, I'm obviously pro electric car, so we need to remove all the internal combustion engines. But seeing the electrical as the unique silver bullet solution to our urban problems is 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 a fallacy. It's yeah, not I, real. I, I, I hope we need a multiplicity of solutions that complement each other, and and it touches urbanism and it touches a bunch of a bunch of, of areas course. that they are not talking to each other. You know, yeah, they, they're each not one is working on their own silo. That's it, and and I think that's what happens is is you know you're an entrepreneur, you're an investor, you see a need, you see a market right? Okay, we have a market, electric cars are going to take off, which means they need batteries, which means they need lithium, which means I should figure out a way to give them lithium. So I develop a new technology for improving lithium extraction and whatever. And that's a market opportunity. But now I've reinforced the system, but I never had a conversation as is what about lithium per se, or batteries per se, it was just like, let me solve this problem, right? Yeah. And so much of what we do is let me just solve this problem that's right in front of me and that has that will potentially create wealth but it doesn't really no one's ever thinking about the broad long term so then we catch up like congress now has the hearings where they bring in the tech executives and they say do you realize your system is being used to fuel you know extremism and terrorism and polarization and and election fraud and and they're like well, I did, that's not why i created it <laughs> i just created it to make a lot of money right <laughs> Um, so now yeah. we have to, after the fact, come up with net neutrality laws and, and, and treaties and COP26, 26, 26 different conferences to get to an agreement that you know no one's going to follow. But, you know, but maybe yeah. there's, there's a little bit, right? We go five step forward, but we want to go five step forward, but we'll take one step forward. Yeah. And it's not fast enough. And, um, and this is the problem because technology will always out accelerate our ability to change and to get all these inertial systems in place. Now, if you want to talk about evolution as, as sort of to wrap all of it, this up, yes. um, you know, what was it about 60 million years ago, 65 million years ago, there was an interesting event where yes. a meteor came into, yes. uh, you know, the, the, the waters off of Mexico. And, uh, and it created um, a scenario of multiple kinds of disruptive forces, right? You had volcanoes and you had, tidal waves and you had climate change accelerated the earth probably got very cold because there was all that cloud around the planet and over the space of you know years hundreds of years thousands of years many many of of the planet species just went extinct could not adapt well enough fast enough etc mm -hmm. but out of all of that extinction came new solutions came the rise of mammals who were always in the shadows of the dinosaurs and we of course go extend back to the mammals, if it wasn't for the Chicxulub meteor, humans would not be here today, right? Yes, it, yes. Something else would be here. Prob and, and who knows if that something else would even be like us or just totally different. Um, it's hard to turn back the clock and, and play it again because it's so contingent on small um, effects. But almost certainly we wouldn't be here. Um, so out of catastrophe, amazing new things can happen was, is the rise of humans good for most other species? And most species did not do well because of humans, right? Bacteria, viruses did really well, rats did well. <laughs> uh, cats and dogs have done really well because of humans, yes. right? Cows, porks, but, chickens. Yeah, but you know, so many you know, birds and other species have not done well. 
Yeah. So, yeah, I think what, what's going to happen is these things are inevitable, Victor, um, and we will adapt as best as we can using our Stone Age mind. We'll always be behind the, the um, power of these things, but it's not all lost because these things um, also can do great good massive good yes. we can have robots that can do surgery um so we can install the robot in a in a small community that can't afford a team of highly specialized surgeons and they, we can do the surgeries for those people we have personalized medicine and personalized genomics coming that will cure your illness and it doesn't have to be a one shot all like we do with chemotherapy which yeah. blasts everything yeah so, you know, so much good is coming. Uh, I want to see a lot of disruption in education because we have an industrial model of education yes. that, that sort of worked in the 60s and 70s, but clearly hasn't really worked and can't solve the problems of the future. We're not educating people correctly. Yeah. So, yeah, there'll, there'll okay. always be good as well yeah. as the bad. Let's, let's, uh, let's finish on a positive note. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, sometimes I think I'm, I'm too much of a pessimist. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Anyway, uh, I normally finish the uh, the episodes with three questions that I I, I I give to my guest, and these are very philosophical, high ended. There is no right or wrong answer. It's just whatever comes to mind. So go here goes the first one. So the uh, longest living species are cyanobacteria that have existed for two point five or so billion years, and the oldest standing human made structure is just a few thousand years old. So how, how do you see our evolution and, and the continuing continuum of our species from that point of view? Is it is, is even feasible to think of, of being as successful as, as a cyanobacteria and be around for billions of years? Um, if we merge our consciousness into you know, various technological systems, yes. And if we take those systems off planet Earth and become an extraplanetary species, yes. So it, it, you know, when people imagine aliens coming to visit Earth, they almost always have that Hollywood iconic image of the green alien that looks humanoid. It just varies in the color of the skin and the number of eyes and so on. And that's, I think that's totally wrong. The aliens that come to Earth will almost certainly be robotic cybernetic systems, right? Because they will have evolved just like we are. And for their ability to, you know, go across interstellar space will require that type of technology that where biological systems can't survive that long, right? So in that sense, we are, we are becoming aliens from ourselves. And then when we, when we figure out how to um, distribute our, our consciousness across the, the galaxy, then yeah, we'll do even better than the cyanobacteria. So, so uh, this, is, this is a theory that I've been, well, theory, this is just a crazy thought of mine that I've been thinking for a while after, after many, many crazy reflections and, and glasses of wine, I guess, the, the, there is the, then the possibility for us as humans to think of ourselves as the, as the grandfathers of a species that will be cybernetic, yeah. um, artificial intelligence, that will be our legacy as a species, yeah. that, that will be the ones Absolutely. traveling our, across the universe and carrying our, our memory and our- Guys our, like you uh, and me will not be here a million years from now. <laughs> Maybe not even 10,000 years from now, I don't know, because again, exponential change, it's hard to make those those uh, predictions, um, you know, the, the, the modern smartphone is a thousand times more powerful than the original one, mm -hmm. right? But it's not a thousand years since the original one. Yes. Right? So yeah. what will it be like even 10 hundred years from now? Um, so yeah, I, I look, I mean, take, take an animal. What is an animal? What is a plant? What is a bacteria? It's just this biological encapsulation of information. Yeah, it's the genetic information, the code to reproduce itself. And it's just use the material of the earth to form a, a sphere, usually, or some version of a sphere that through a semi permeable membrane protects itself from the rest of the mm -hmm. environment. And then it just interacts. And that's all I'm talking about that same evolutionary process, which which for the last four and a half billion years was biological will now become cultural, technological, biological. It will integrate all of them until it becomes more and more purely just informational, I think. And then it just expands yeah. and expands. In, in, in that sense, the, the, the concept of life as we know it now, it will disappear eventually. I don't know if it'll disappear because not all life forms will do that. So as long as the other life forms don't, the other forms um, don't, 
make it impossible for the life forms as we understand them to survive, I think it'll be fine. I, I believe that, that the universe is full of biological life. I mean, the discovery of extra, you know, Earth-like planets throughout the exoplanets, fantastic. And, and before, you know, I, I move on to a different dimension, um, I would love to know with definitive scientific proof that there is life on other planets, even if it's a fossil of a bacteria on <laughs> Venus, that will, that will unlock the door and say, now anything is possible. I truly believe it is. Um, yes, but I just, I just want that little signature. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah. moving, moving on. Second question, almost at the end. Um, what do you think is the importance of failure in discovery and human progress? I, I, I used to like the Silicon Valley kind of mantra of fail fast, fail often in order to succeed. Um, I think that that is a very dangerous thing to teach students if you, d you teach it incompletely. So what, what school is, what education is, is, is an artificial environment that we have created that, that really is about failing in a safe way so that you can then learn. But perversely, we penalize failure in school by giving you a poor performance grade, which then prevents you from going to the next level and makes you feel it damages your self-efficacy and, yes. and creates polarization. And so we, we've done a, a, a really poisonous thing in a beautiful environment. We created the safe environment and then we destroyed it in a way for many, many students. Failure, you know, if you're a pilot and you're flying a plane and you fail, you kill everyone. There is no sense in that universe where failure is a good thing, right? And when the surgeon is operating on your brain tumor, failure is a terrible catastrophic thing. Failing on climate change is a catastrophic thing, right? Failing to feed my son is catastrophic. So there are many failures that truly need to be avoided, need to be predicted and need to be mitigated and, and, and so on. And they, they, there's another saying from pilots that good pilots avoid error or failure and great, you know, they know how to get out of it, but the good, the really great ones avoid it in the first place. Yeah. So it's one thing to be able to deal with a crisis. It's another thing to avoid it in the first place through intelligence and prediction. So, you know, this is, I think this is where we are at with so many of our problems. We now have enough knowledge and data and insight and the ability to communicate with people to know what's going on. We can see that the planet is in crisis, that, that our social structures are in crisis. They're, they worked for a long time, but now they're reaching that structural limit where they're about to break if they're not already breaking. And we can do something about it. We can act intelligently. We can act out of enlightened self-interest. So yes, let's send the, the vaccines to, to, to Africa because not only is that morally and ethically the right thing to do, spiritually the right thing to do for our brothers and sisters there, but it'll also help us from a self-interested point of view, because then, you know, we all will, will have um, global immunity. So this is where I'm at, is, is we have to be able to use this godlike intelligence that we've been given yeah. um, to act in, in ways that really help all of us and help ourselves. And we know how to do it. Excellent. Excellent. Super interesting. Thank you so much. Right. Last question. Um, so describe for us the future of your choosing. Uh, you can select, you know, a hundred years from now, a thousand or ten thousand years from now, and and how do you imagine that future? What it will look like? Oh, for for humanity itself. For yes, humanity, life, planet, everything. I'm not I'm not sure about about the right time, but let's say the near future, coming to a future near you. Um, I would love to see us uh, terraform Venus. Everyone's focused on Mars, but Venus is almost identical to Earth and it's warmer, it's more tropical. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of its size, its mass, the gravity, everything, it's like a, a, it's our, a twin sister, but we've forgotten about it because it's the worst place in the entire solar system. That should cause us pause. How did an Earth-like planet become hell, right? I mean, the pressure, the, the supersonic winds, it rains sulfur, it's, it's outrage, and that could happen to Earth, right? It's conceivable that we could become a hell-like place too. So Venus should serve as both the inspiration, but also the warning that we can't take anything for granted. And even looking at our own history of Earth, 
of the various extinctions. There was an ice age where there was a kilometer of ice above North America. You know, it, this planet for all its beauty and, and um, riches has also been a very violent, difficult place as well. So nothing should be taken for granted. Um, and we are the stewards now for better or worse, because we have the power, we have the influence, we have the technology, we can actually alter the, the future of life on earth. That's an awesome godlike responsibility. And yes. it must come with humility. And it must come with the notion that we need the bacteria. We need the mice. We need everything. Uh, because it's all, as the indigenous perspective has said, it's all a web. And we keep yes. learning that. Corona, if nothing else, taught us that it's all a web, mm -hmm. right? That, that something that's barely alive conceptually, a virus, could rip its way across different categories of life all the way up to the most powerful vaunted species and bring us to our knees. And it's not even done yet. It's not even started if it wanted to, right? So we have to approach the future with intelligence, with humility, with compassion for each other, but not to become, you know, so fearful of technology that we give up all of that either, because there's a tendency for people to do that. Yeah. And, you know, the, the original notion of the Luddite, which has a very negative connotation right now as someone who hates technology and wants to be primitive and so on. It's not at all the truth. It, it arose in England during the time of the Industrial Revolution when you had textile manufacturers and, I mean, workers who worked with their hands. They were craftspeople. They, were, they had guilds. And then the new loom and weaving technologies were, were putting them out of work. And they rose up against that technology because they wanted to keep their craft alive and their employment and their families would be sustained by that. And so it was just a very natural reaction. We, we would see it anywhere where, where, whenever someone's being displaced for whatever reason is they react violently sometimes, politically, they, they you know, form alliances. And so we've done that within ourselves for so long but now it's time to form an alliance of the global human species against this common threat the common threat of, of viruses the common threat of climate chaos the common threat of poverty the common so many common threats that affect all of us if only we see ourselves as a common united family on this beautiful planet here here Completely. I agree. That was fantastic. Um, Farhad, I, I could continue. It's almost two hours we, 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 we chat and I can easily do two more or more. I feel like it's, we're just um, It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. It's been really, truly fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Victor, too. Really great questions. And, and what you're doing here is important. And these are the kinds of conversations that need to happen at, at, at you know, the educational system and then to share it with others uh, to get them to, to provoke their thinking. So, great. Excellent. Good, good job. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm back for a final reflection. This time the episode was very long. I didn't want to edit too much out because the conversation was so interesting. Uh, Dr. Dastur's conversation skills and knowledge are captivating and enlightening. Uh, so I won't take much uh, too much time right now. Um, first of all, is, is the notion of um, humans being simply a bio biological manifestation of life in this planet and that evolution is fundamentally about change. Therefore, you know, if our brain, just like any other organ, has evolved to. Uh, but change now is, is happening so fast that our brains cannot evolve fast enough. That is why we say that we have these stone age brains in, in a modern world. And this idea paves the way to think that the only possible way forward is to merge the technology with the biology. And I accept that I have a bit of a pessimistic approach to things. Um, Dr. Dastur has given us a very balanced, a well-balanced view of things. You know? And the idea that with every technology there is a Pandora box, but there is also a panacea. And we also talk a lot about cooperation and competition that are natural strategies, which make a lot of sense in a finite world. You know? But competition, by definition, implies that there are winners and losers. Cooperation, instead, could mean that we may not get a lot, but everyone should get enough to ensure a fair and decent living. Just like the examples of healthcare and education, so we give up a partially a financial gain 
in this case in the form of taxes. But we all benefit by having a healthy and educated population that improves the general community we all live in at the end. Lastly, I initially thought it was a curious coincidence, but it's logic when you see the history and understands the, understand the context and the trajectory of things to think that in the future, the legacy of humans as a species in the very long term is one, in the stewardship of life on Earth, and secondly, the transformation of our own species into an interplanetary one, uh, one that is capable of in interstellar travel that most surely will mean a form of integration of technology and biology, which in other words is a cybernetic organism. This may sound a bit scary, I, I agree, but it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. But let's, let's close it here. This is all, I guess, for this time. I hope you enjoy and you found it interesting and gives you a lot of uh, things to think about. Um, please share your thoughts, uh, please comment and like so others can find about it. Um, we are about halfway through of this uh, first series of interviews. Uh, there are more compensations coming. Uh, we have a, an economist, a philosopher and, and more coming. So subscribe you don't, so you don't miss them. And thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll meet you in the uh, next episode. Future Exploration is produced and written by me, Victor Martinez. Music is composed by Rafael Crux, Uda Yana Lugo, and Mauro and Daniel Martinez. Future Exploration is licensed under the Creative Commons with attribution and non-commercial use.